Today we are going to focus a bit more on what the meaning of justice in the transition is. So as, as I said before, justice is also about a journey and an experience, but I do want to just give you some examples from around the world about what different, uh, let's say, organizations or different countries are looking at what do they, how do they define what justice is for this uh, just transition. And I just want to, let's say first, bring in uh, something from yesterday, but the, the modeling for the just transition so that they uh, get us thinking about that, then thinking more about justice and some solutions. So when we think, let's say, how do financiers or economists or policymakers what are they thinking about justice? What are they including? And here is a diagram. It may not be fully, uh, let's say, readable uh, to you at the moment. But the, the essence of the idea is they're trying to bring in many, many factors into, let's say, their policy mechanism or their economic modeling. So sometimes they can have 70, 80, uh, let's say 70, 80 different variables and potentially as much as um, you know, several hundred variables that they're trying to bring in to uh, their models. So these are just some examples from the literature, but we're thinking also how have people been approaching this issue from less, uh, let's say from developing countries and it, will it be the same? Uh, how different will it be? And we can actually see, let's say from this example, we can see uh, this is one where it was, it was essentially done for risk analysis for lending money to developing countries for a just transition. And you can see here, um, they factored in data under what they call social dialogue. And they look at issues such as uh, the macroeconomic, the industrial sector, they look at enterprise skills, the labor market, they look at occupation, you know, so health and safety at the workplace, they look at, you know, do you have social protection uh, for jobs? And the idea here is very much, uh, you can see, they get a lot of um, this perspective from the International Labor Organization, which I know you've been looking at in some other classes, but they're getting the data from that. It's very, this part of the um, analysis or this part of the data collection is very much around uh, jobs. But if we take a step further, we can see some of the other indicators. Um, let's say for me, uh, this, this model was done by uh, HSBC Bank, which is one of the biggest multinational banks, biggest lenders in the world. And the fact, the fact that one of these very big banks is focusing on the just transition and how they're analyzing the just transition internally um, is very significant. And another significant issue is if you look at the source of information on the side, you will see that they're using data sources that are all free that are all accessible for everyone. So you don't need to be a, let's say, big leading company and you're purchasing the data from, let's say, a data provider like um, uh, Bloomberg, which sells uh, a whole range of data. But the, this data you can get for free. So you can see the data that they're using for looking at the socio-economic transition. So connecting beyond just an economic transition, they're thinking about the socio-economic transition. And you can see they're looking at the level of economic development, they're looking at the business environment, the level of social uh, development, and employer indicator, the expenditure on social protection. Um, so you can see those different metrics 
many of you may have come across the second one there, which is very popular um, for a lot of research or a lot of policy making, or even a lot of decision making by companies, is the World Bank cost of doing business. So you're looking at proper cost of doing business is in a certain country. And sometimes you can see that become part of the political debate. Um, let's say in the newspapers or the news, you may see that in Colombia where there may be discussions around if we move away too quickly from oil and gas and coal, we may have problems that may increase uh, the cost of living, or essentially for big businesses they'll be talking about, that increase the cost of doing business. And what happens when the cost of business goes up? That means investors will begin to move to other countries. And, and money will flow out of the country to other countries because to invest in your country, they consider that made that cost uh, too high. Then, more specifically, they look at the energy sector. So you can see, again, the dominance of the energy sector in uh, the analysis of a just transition. You see the level of elect electricity access, the prominence of fossil fuels in the electricity mix, and the level of ambition in the energy transition. So things that I've highlighted over the last few days, but if you're looking for Again, if you're looking for data, again, this data is all free and downloadable. So you can do, you know, if you were interested, you could do your own uh, analysis utilizing the same data sources. But you can see, um, you know, the, the level of electricity access that may vary as well in different parts of the country. Um, the prominence of fossil fuels in the electricity mix, again, um, that will be different from country to country. So you are acknowledging that countries will be different in this transition. And even the, let's say, big businesses are acknowledging there is going to be a difference from country to country because nearly every country has a slightly different energy mix. Then the level of ambition of the energy transition, again, that's going to be quite different. So as I stated before, Every country has signed up to the Paris Agreement. Colombia has a 2030 ambition. It has a 2050 ambition. And the significance, let's say, in Colombia is they are using that word, a just energy transition, for that ambition already. So if you were to compare Colombia with other countries, you would be saying, uh, you could very simply say that Colombia has more ambition than many other countries. But if you want some of the data, you can go to this data source and begin to say, how is Colombia more ambitious than other countries? You know, and then feed, feed that, let's say, into um, your model. And here is everything, let's say, fed into the model. Um, so on, on this one, uh, Colombia is, isn't there, but you can see a whole range of other countries. Um, where they're looking for, uh, they're looking to rank these countries. And you can see um, they're talking about, they use that word precondition for a just transition. And it, you might remember when we were talking about the transition yesterday, we had that diagram of what a transition may look like and you're looking at the very bottom is precondition. Do you have a baseline for a just transition? So you can see um, how some of the countries are performing. Maybe you think there's maybe a few surprises. Maybe you could say maybe Iran, uh, maybe a surprise in the middle that it's uh, further ahead than some of the other countries. Um, even Russia um, is further ahead despite using a lot of oil and gas. Um, but maybe some countries are making significant progress. So 
you want to be following this data over time and I could tell you that let's say Vietnam has made more progress, you, South Africa has made more progress, um, South Korea, China, Brazil all have made more progress. But that's what you're thinking um, of and you can see then these indicators that they're using to analyze the just transition. And this, remember, is a big financial institution which is lending money based off this analysis. So what they are saying is to the investors who are investing money with them, but also their own investments, they are saying which country or countries are better to invest in. So if your country is not up at the top, maybe if you're down, uh, let's say, towards Pakistan, you know, you're going to invest more in the countries at the top. And that reflects what I said earlier. When we think of a just transition to a low carbon economy, in today's world, we are talking about a global financial market. The international investor is always looking at what a country is doing because they can take their money out of one country and put it into another country. And that's the challenge. Let's say that's the big challenge for a government. So the next time you think about the politicians in your country, you know, they have a, it is a difficult job because they do have to make sure the investment community is looking at the country in an attractive way. So if you make bad decisions, you may slide down this, let's say, slide down to the bottom. And the, the more you're at the bottom, the more you will be relying, not just, you know, it'll be hard, harder to get private finance, you will have to rely more, let's say, on uh, development aid, and there are many countries in competition for that. So, thinking about the stakeholders who are engaged, just a brief um, example, you can see here, um, government, civil society, workers and unions, and the private sector, or you know, which generally is big, big business, but also investors. And they have to do, you know, you have to look at how are these stakeholders involved in the process. So there are some, uh, you know, some examples. So maybe one example would be that. In some of the, in one or two of the regions in Colombia, while you have civil society, you have workers and unions, and you even have the private sector involved in the region trying to go ahead and build clean energy that maybe over the last few years, maybe until just very recently, that the government hasn't really taken a, a sufficient role in trying to get projects uh, to go ahead and get them developed uh, or get them started. So, you know, here are just some examples of different actions that have been happening in different countries. So you can see in civil society, um, in the Philippines, Vietnam and Nigeria, there has been a lot of consultation with civil society over um, the nationally determined contributions essentially um, essentially they've been working with citizens to highlight this is what we signed up to for the Paris Agreement this is this is the 2030 objective and often we see uh, countries not telling their citizens this is the journey we need to go on until 2030 so if you were looking for examples of countries that have tried to educate their population, there are three examples. Another example of civil society in Indonesia, thinking of developing communities. There's a lot of remote uh, communities in Indonesia. It's an island nation made up of, I think, a couple of thousand islands. They can't be building coal plants or gas plants on every island. It's easier to build renewable energy if you're 
uh, targeting, uh, you know, in increasing electricity access, for example. So again, um, some of those, uh, let's say, examples of success in terms of the just transition, you can also see the private sector in the Philippines and Mexico working with the private sector to show them you need to transform and you need to um, work towards the 2030 goal that we signed up to for the Paris Agreement. And if you remember, um, I highlighted a case in the Netherlands uh, yesterday where the, the judges or the courts, the lawyers, stepped in and said Shell, the big energy company, had to change its strategy for the company because Shell was not working towards the 2030 objectives of uh, the Netherlands, of the government, of the population of the Netherlands. Here you can see uh, the Philippines and Mexico were already working with uh, big business in their countries. And that is very important to see for the international investor because you want to see that the companies are changing their approach, they are moving from what we class as a business as usual approach to changing towards a just transition to a low carbon economy. And again, countries are, or let, let's say investors are looking to see um, that change. Here are some other examples for uh, sector plans, um, employment policies, um, social policies and you know just to highlight one in Bangladesh they introduced a new labor act so they wanted to transform their labor policy for a just transition again when the investor is looking at how has a country changed they are looking for all of these different types of variables if you can show how you have trans you are tr trying to change then the international community is going to look more favorably, whether you're looking for private sector finance or even development aid. So if you remember, Bangladesh was down at the bottom. Therefore, you know, on the rankings, they would be looking for more development aid. But if they can show they are on that just transition journey, they will be seen as more attractive to receive that development aid. And that's why transforming the labor law would be seen as a significant uh, development. South Africa, another example, if you look at social policies, they have put more and more money into spending on social policies, a whole variety of social policies. And significantly, in South Africa, they've also tried to introduce a carbon tax where they actually said part of the revenue they collect from that carbon tax is going to go straight into clean energy development and that is a change from maybe other countries that have a carbon tax and the carbon tax just goes back to the government we don't know where you know it's going to be spent uh, we don't know what it's going to be spent on but that is a good example of um, a change in policy and uh, something that will be very attractive again, an attractive reason to invest in South Africa in terms of them meeting their just transition goals. And you can see then in Indonesia, Indonesia maybe in some way has a, a slight similarity to Colombia because Indonesia has a lot of its own oil and gas, the oil and gas is running out, they also have a lot of coal, uh, the coal is, is running out too, um, but they need a big transition away uh, from fossil fuels and uh, you know they rely on fossil fuels, they sell them uh, internationally as well, they rely, rely on that revenue, but they have been looking at reforming this, all the subsidies given to fossil fuels and even looking at how clean energy connects to the electricity grid because currently 
let's say, if clean energy wants to connect to the electricity grid, it has to pay. Fossil fuels has not paid uh, before. So it's essentially a cost advantage that fossil fuels has. But they have been looking at a whole variety and trying to transform uh, those fossil fuel subsidies. So again, thinking about an attractive country to develop, um, you would be looking at, um, you could be looking at South Africa or Indonesia for those, re uh, those reasons. But another one in uh, the very first volume there, you'll see the Green Economy Accord and the National Development Plan. A new approach introduced in South Africa directly uh, for having a just low carbon society. So a bit similar to what's happening in Colombia, again looking, uh, introducing that word justice directly into law and policy. So if you want to summarize briefly, think about you know, you're, if you are looking at a particular country and you're, you're trying to just have a brief analysis to yourself, how is my country doing or how is this other country doing in comparison to my country? What you might be looking at is, you, you would look at first is what's the current situation and what's the, the planned situation? So what's the situation today in, 2030, in 2023? What, does, what did our country sign up to in 2030 or 2050? You might look at some recent international or domestic issues. What's happening internationally that's affecting us? That could be, you know, we buy too much, um, let's say, oil from another country. We buy too much gas. Um, you know, our, a lot of our food production comes from another country. Therefore, we're subject to transport costs. Um, then you would look at what's the vision or plan for a just transition to a low carbon economy. Um, you can mention some of the factors that I was talking about in the model or think about some of the other areas I mentioned before. You think of some of the challenges and then, you know, that are specific to your country, and then you think about the process ahead. What is the journey? that we can go on uh, given some of these challenges, given some of the domestic issues, given that we're starting off in 2023 and this is the current situation. So just, if you are out, if you are having a table of contents for a just transition analysis of a country, these would be, uh, let's say, the contents that you could have and base your, your study on. So, when we talk specifically then of justice, I just want to give a few examples. These may vary from country to country. But generally, when we talk of justice, we're, we're not talking of justice uh, very specific when we use these terms. Because these terms also, you know, they come from generally accepted terminology from the United Nations. So if you think of the 195 countries, uh, there's more who are part of the United Nations, but if you think of the 195 countries who've signed up to the Paris Agreement, you have a whole variety of countries. You have some countries um, who are ruled by a president, a prime minister. You have some that have uh, different types of uh, kings or queens. Uh, you have some that have one party governments and there's a rotation policy for um, you know for the leader for the prime minister of that country. You have some um, let's say what people would refer to maybe as a communist country. So you have a whole variety of different types of uh, ways that countries are governed. Not every country is a democracy. That doesn't mean they can't achieve a, you know, a just transition to a low carbon economy. It doesn't mean that they're not committed to energy and climate targets. You know, most, all the country, 195, have signed up and committed to targets. And they can achieve them despite whatever way they are ruled. 
and these types of justice come in irrespective of the way countries through their accepted uh, terms internationally. And let's say I just want to go back to the example that I gave. Uh, you know, there are five forms. The U.S. has um, brought in those for those form part or for those principles of justice into their policy making. So, if you want to be engaging with the government essentially uh, today in the U.S. around uh, energy, around more broadly around the just transition, you have to be talking about this type of justice procedure, distributive recognition or uh, restorative. But here you can read the, you can look at the definitions uh, more easily. And it's not to say that, let's say, if Colombia comes along and says we want to utilize these forms of justice um, ourselves, they, they can go ahead and do that. They don't have to take the specific definitions that the US use, they can go and search for more. But generally, uh, these types of justice are relatively uh, straightforward. And procedural justice essentially is about correcting the system. You know, in, in a system, you have lots of different procedures, processes. And essentially that's what procedural justice is. How do we rebalance the system? Currently, the system is designed to make, uh, if, if we're being, let's say if we're being uh, cynical, we would say the system is designed to make 1% of people very rich. If you think of who, who is very rich today, Bill Gates, he goes around the world. Um, some people would say it's very good that he's doing charity. Other people would say he's only going into that country to do charity so at the same time he can sell Microsoft to the government and the whole government will be using Microsoft at the end of his visit where he's given some personal money from his charity to you know two different charities. It's not to say his charitable contrib contributions are bad, but you're perpetuating someone becoming uh, more wealthy and, a, and an international, a multinational becoming more wealthy. And that's what we think is, we look at the data, the data shows us that we are living in an era where the 1% are owning more and more. So I think the last data I saw was that the 1% one, 1 of people in the world own more than the lowest 50% of people in the world. So that is a huge, inequality that we have. So if you think about that system, that whole system from internationally all the way to national, local, that would all be under procedural justice. We need to correct that system and reform it. And here you see the US uh, specifically saying it's about meaningful particip increasing participation in decision making. If we had more Particip participation in decision making, we may not have all those inequalities because people would highlight the problems in the system earlier so then we can fix those problems before we start. And you can see that they link it in with the project life cycle. So specifically for energy, they talk about making sure that we look at the system from the very start, we think about the problems from the very start before we give that project uh, permission to go ahead. Then you can think about distrib distributive justice. If you want a simple way of understanding distributive justice, distributive justice is all about the money. How is money distributed across the world? Is it distributed fairly? How much profit is a company making. Today, most companies, they don't make big profits. They make big revenue. And they, they uh, make sure that a lot of that revenue um, 
you know, they, they, they say that they have a lot of expenses. So a lot of the expenses leave your country, but actually the reality is a lot of the expenses are profits. And if you look at Apple, uh, at one stage, I think a couple of years ago, Apple had, I think, nearly 200 billion in offshore accounts. But if you determined what profits they were making around the world, nowhere could you find they were making such high profits. So they, they focus on having revenue and high expenses, and they use uh, different tax havens, uh, you know, we're relatively close to the Caribbean here, and there is a few tax havens in the Caribbean. Any, anyone name the countries in the Caribbean that are considered tax havens? But since, since this has been recorded, I won't uh, put pressure on anyone. But actually, uh, originally I come from Ireland in Europe which is actually one of the biggest tax havens in the world. And we actually have Apple located, an Apple headquarters located in Ireland. And at one stage, the European Union said, Apple should pay Ireland 20 billion in taxation because we, we, weren't, we were giving them so many tax breaks. The Irish government said, no, we don't want, we're, we're going to object to receiving that 20 billion. And this is despite uh, Ireland as a country, maybe 10 years before going bankrupt. Uh, so they owe a lot of money, but they didn't want to lose the jobs from the company. And they said that the jobs were worth more than the 20 billion. Essentially, the politicians said, you know, if we, we may be out of a job, if other people are out of a job, they won't vote for our party at the next election, and therefore they rejected 20 billion. But this is the way the international financial system works, and you need to be thinking, all these foreign companies, are they, is there a proper, a fair distribution of the money here? And if you look at the energy sector in particular in Colombia, um, in a couple of cases, Colombia has tried to get more money back from these companies, and these companies have then sued uh, the Colombian government for e even up to, I think, two or three billion in one case. So the distributive justice is trying to ensure that people are paying a fair price for energy, trying to ensure that a lot of the, um, a sufficient amount of the revenue from energy resources stays in the country. Um, and can be utilised by the country, and it isn't all just leaving um, the country. And you can see here, uh, for America, they have said it should deliver tangible benefits to local communities. And that is a big problem in the past. Oil, gas and coal did not leave any benefits, or very minimal benefits, uh, to local communities. And that's why there's a huge level of distrust between companies and local communities. Um, recognition justice is more about the who you're identifying, who is affected by a particular project, and you want to make sure you're including all the people. It may be an indigenous community, it may be a more broad local community, it could be a neighboring community, who are affected maybe by the water supply being polluted because they get their water from this, uh, you know, from this region. So you have to identify all the people who may be affected. Restorative justice, you're looking at cleaning up after the problems um, that have been created. So any type of project is going to create some environmental impact but the company should be addressing uh, that environmental impact. They should be cleaning up after um, the operation and they should have money uh, to clean up. They shouldn't be going uh, bankrupt. And the key word here 
is a legacy pollution problem. And if you look today what's happening, clean energy companies in many countries, and my belief is including here in Colombia, clean energy companies are having to today contribute to the cleanup of, in some cases, what oil or gas companies and, and coal companies have done in a region. So not only are they paying to build new energy infrastructure, they're paying to clean up the, the problems that these other companies have left. And in many cases, these other companies have left, they've taken all the money with them, they earned lots of profits, but they haven't paid for the profits. And this is a, re a further reason why clean energy can sometimes be seen as a higher cost uh, energy source. And again, I just you know, want to highlight in more detail, you can see here where the US government took the definitions from, directly from uh, different research papers. Um, the author of this research paper was appointed by President Biden. Uh, Shalanda Baker was the first author. Um, so she got the job, you know, you could say, um, well, well, she had done lots of research in the area, but, you know, the definitions were directly from her uh, paper. But you can see they come uh, directly from different uh, academic research. And in a similar way, you could imagine other countries taking their own definition from different research. It doesn't have to be the specific ones the US took, but this is what we, we, we expect to see around the world. You need to just take one definition and move forward. You can't keep debating the definition of procedural justice for you know, the next 10 years. That, that is just a delaying tactic by certain stakeholders that they don't want action to happen. They would prefer to discuss uh, the definitions for the next five or 10 years. And that's why the US just said, here are our definitions. We will work with them. They're not final definitions, they are the working definitions. So I would hope that all of you will consider, you know, when you're thinking about this, just take one definition, use that. You can always adapt or change it later on. And I just wanted to give a brief example of some of these uh, justices in practice. You can think of carbon markets as an example of distributive justice. Essentially what a carbon market is, is charging the polluter and redistributing that money and saying, you know, we should use that money in different ways or because we put the tax on carbon companies respond in different ways. So think about some of these benefits of carbon pricing. Efficiency is a big one. You can see efficiency in transport, efficiency in the home, um, and efficiency in other, let's say, appliances that we use in the home. By having a carbon tax, people become aware, I don't want to use this product because it uses a lot of energy. I will buy this other product which uses much less energy. So you're, you're putting pressure on other uh, parts of, let's say, the industry value chain to transform. And then that money can go back to the consumer. It essentially moves away from the company who's actually causing the problem. And you can use some of that taxation uh, money to lower taxes in other areas for business, businesses and also uh, you know, individuals. So that's a case of redistribu redistributing money in the energy sector from introducing a carbon tax. And that's why many countries across the world are looking at various ways of introducing a carbon tax because uh, there's no reason why oil and gas companies or coal companies should be earning such high profits while producing all this carbon dioxide. They should have to pay for um, 
something for producing that carbon dioxide. And again, related to this is another example in procedural justice we think about project development for an energy uh, project. And here, the big change we see recently um, is the big change is decommissioning. Making sure that when a company starts out, they already have a decommissioning plan. Um, I think we had a question about nuclear energy the very first day. But actually, if you want to build a nuclear energy plant in, in any country today nearly, you have to have a plan of decommissioning before you start to, con to construct. And actually, you actually have a, an agreement with the government the minute you start producing electricity, you will pay into a decommissioning fund that is under control of the government. The idea being that you have a fund at the end that is there to clean up after the nuclear energy plant and to pay for the nuclear waste. And that has been going on for nearly 30 or 40 years. The nuclear energy sector has had a decommissioning plan. They pay into a fund for nearly 30 or 40 years. And my question would be, why has that not been happening for 30 or 40 years for oil, gas, or coal? Okay, so uh, just as I was saying, the decommissioning part, so nuclear energy has had decommissioning as part of its plan and pays into a fund for the last 30, 40 years. Why has that not happened for other energy sources? And if you, if you remember yesterday, I talked about the way people think about energy. People want to think about energy from the energy source perspective so that they can talk about oil separately, gas separately, coal separately, and treat them separately. And this is an easy example that nuclear has had this policy in place, but we haven't transferred it to the other energy sources. And again, you know, that, that will be an exam, another example of procedural justice. Here, an example of restorative justice um, the UN has said that this 10 years is going to be the decade of restorative justice. And you can see, for those who are interested, they have even um, got 10 restoration principles that the UN have pushed forward. And this is very significant because it's not just thinking about restorative justice from the energy sector, it's about everything. Um, I was looking yesterday that apparently from satellite images you can see waste sites in Chile that have the waste of lots of clothes. You know, the, the whole, uh, what's termed as fast fashion. So the next time you, you go out and buy very, very cheap clothing, you should remember that that is a problem in the world, you know, later on your t-shirt is probably going to end up on a beach or a mountain in Chile um, or, you know, other countries. But we are thinking about all sectors in our economy, they have to think about this issue of restorative justice. And I don't know, let's say the policy here, but I know in France where I, uh, where I teach and work, and also in the EU, they are trying to make even the computer and mobile phone industry essentially think more about restorative justice. So that if you get the, you know, the core, the cable for your phone, it should be able to work in any phone or your computer. It shouldn't be that every time you, you need to buy a new cable, every time you buy a new phone or computer, you need to buy a new cable. It costs you extra money but that costs extra waste for society, so they're making the companies think about restart. start. But here you can see the UN supporting directly different projects to restore, um, let's say, nature across the world.
You can also, uh, put, moving on to recognition justice, here's an example to say, uh, let's say what is happening in Canada. Canada has a huge problem of, uh, in terms of dealing with local communities. They have indigenous communities as well, but let's say in a different uh, way of trying to approach the problem. They have provided a fund of 300 million available until 2027 for local communities to try and develop some type of clean energy project. So while, while they are trying to, um, let's say, increase trust with local communities, one way of, of doing that is to try and incentivize local communities. They can become entrepreneurial, they can contribute to this just transition to low carbon economy and they have a fund there that they can apply to and that fund is administered by an independent council so you know there's not going to be bias of you know your your friend or your cousin is in charge and you get the money to do uh, you know some type of project so the idea again is to be um, more fair and you can you can also see the overlap in some of these policies so i mean here you're targeting the indigenous people but you're also giving you know you're allocating money to develop the region so you're distributing money as well so actually this is an example of both recognition and distributive justice um, cosmopolitan justice is one that is has been, it has been around for a long while it should not be confused with uh, drinking uh, your cosmopolitan cocktail um, you know you should be thinking um, it's a philosophy to uh, you know thousands of years old and the idea is you're thinking that you are we are all citizens of the world you know yeah. if you um, America keeps polluting the world as fast as it, it is doing per capita. That's a problem for all of us. You know, there's a reason. You could argue there's a reason why um, cars, petrol, lots of goods are so cheap in America because they have a very, very high pollution per capita, and that's you know how they subsidise uh, that. But they, in terms of um, we should be thinking we are all citizens of, this, of the same world, but equally, we're all citizens of the same country. You have to be thinking what's happening in the regions can affect you living in a city and also uh, the other way around. But the biggest example of cosmopolitan justice is what have you signed up to? And what are you actually really going to achieve? So that level of You've stated your ambition in the Paris Agreement. You had to renew your ambition in 2021. You'll have to renew it again in 2025. But how, how realistic is the ambition? And that's your obligation to other countries uh, to change. So, so that's why many people feel that China and the US have a very big obligation because they have high, you know, uh, well, China produces a lot of CO2, but let's say the US has a high figure for uh, CO2 per capita. But people feel they have a big obligation to change. And that obligation comes in under this cosmopolitan perspective. And you can see this happen directly in an example from Australia. Um, you know, you don't need to un understand everything on that slide, but the basic premise is uh, a, coal, a company wanted to develop a coal mine in Australia and the judge or the court system, the lawyers, they said you could, the final decision was the company could not develop the coal mine because they said Australia did not want to be responsible for the coal that w would be then burnt in other countries because Australia was exporting the coal to some countries in Asia 
and they said we don't want to be responsible for carbon dioxide produced in these Asian countries. So that is a significant development of a country saying we are not going to profit from energy because we believe it will cause pollution in other countries. And that's something, ho you know, hopefully we would see more and more of. And we have seen similar decisions made in other countries, also in Kenya, uh, a similar decision based around a, a coal, I think it was a coal mine, or coal, a coal mine and an electricity producing uh, coal plant. So let's say um, when we think of a transition, we think of justice, we can be thinking of those five forms of justice that I spoke about. But the idea here, if you look at this, uh, what we're trying to achieve, we are trying to improve just outcomes. Every outcome we have from a particular activity in society, we want it to be more just. And if we go back to yesterday, we're thinking the decision maker has to be able to show how they tried to make the decision, the outcome, more just. You're not always worried about the meaning of justice, you're not always worried about the process, but you're saying, in five years, when we get there, will we have more fairness, more equality, more equity, so more equitable distribution maybe of the resources, more inclusive inclusivity, so the idea we're not leaving um, anyone behind. Thank you very much, Professor Everett.